Welcome, Carmen Baker. It's fabulous to be with you again this evening. Forgive my um, my mistake of calling you Carmen Clark on all of the social media promotion, <laughs> but that's how I knew you 20 years ago. <laughs> that, that is great. That is, it is a wonderful thing that we knew each other 20 years or yeah. really like more, right? Like 21. Yes. So I'll give a little background of how we connected. And then um, if you don't mind sharing kind of your bio, usually I have something I can read, but I'd like to hear it from your point of view anyway. Um, so when I first had my first baby, we moved to Teaneck, New Jersey, and I didn't know a single soul and I was breastfeeding and I knew that I needed support breastfeeding because I had already had some pretty major issues early on. And I showed up to Carmen's La Leche League group and um, Susan Esterman, also a great leader there. And these ladies just took me under their wing and um, they were my, my role models, the women I looked up to. Um, at that time you had three boys and then you had another. And, um, but I didn't know a lot about you before motherhood, but I just knew you were a professional dancer. You looked the role. Um, so give us a little background. So I, mean, I can tell you a little bit about me. I mean, I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I am one of four daughters. I attended a very nice high school down there. And I was, I mean, I began dancing when I was seven years old, like many little girls. And, but I was very athletic and I loved to dance. I loved to music. A little piece ties into my mother. My mother was a piano. It was a classical pianist and she was an amazing, very passionate pianist, very talented. And a story I like to tell is that she was put us to bed every night and then she would go sit at her piano and practice her Bach, her Beethoven, her Tchaikovsky, her Schubert, her Liszt, wow. her Brahms, all of these classics. And I would get out of bed and just open my door a tiny little bit so I could hear her better. And then I would fall asleep to that. So our life was filled with music. And I just, you know, as a young kid, you just sort of take that for granted and you don't realize how special that actually and how much it actually influenced me as well. So I ex chose to express my emotions, my feelings through dance. So that's kind of like how I got into, into dancing. You know, eventually I ended up going to Princeton University. I have a bachelor's of arts in um, art and archaeology. And I worked for the Whitney Museum of American Art for a couple of years before I dove into just dancing in New York City with a couple of different dance companies. Um, by 1991, one, I was pregnant with my first child, who is now going to be 30 <laughs> at the end, uh, the beginning of this December, you know. Uh, so I tried to combine continuing dancing and being a mother and breastfeeding. I mean, I remember going to uh, many rehearsals with a three month old in tote with the dance company that I was, I was dancing with a modern dance company and a ballet company at the time. And I would bring him to rehearsals. I had a sister that met me and I would just do the rehearsals, breastfeed him the breaks. And uh, I tried to make, make it as, work, as best as I possibly could. Um, but I mean, to the point that even further down the road, I think it was, I was having my second or my third kid, the choreographer incorporated me having to dash out to breastfeed and then run back in in the middle of movement. Um, so just to the, reflect the, the, the tr reality of trying to keep on with your career and also being a mother at that time. Right. Um, eventually in 2000, uh, well, no, it was 1990. Well, I was attending La Leche League meetings and in 1998, I became a La Leche League leader. Um, I kind of like left the art history career behind and just was a mom and occasionally still dancing and, and teaching dance and things like that, but also being a mom. And I loved um, connecting with other women through La Leche Lee, uh, mm -hmm. Phoenix at the time. And I prepared to become a leader. And in 1998, I became a, a, 
La Leche League leader. I was accredited. So I think when I met you, I most likely was already pregnant with my fourth baby. Soon after I arrived. Yeah. Yeah. And I, he was born on Christmas of 2000. So we had, you know, I don't know if we overlapped two kids, but um, when did you have your second? So she was 2002. And had you already moved away? No. So I was still in Teaneck with her. Yeah. She was born um, in my bedroom, in my bed. (laughs) Like my last child, who was also yeah. born in my bedroom. <laughs> it's Valerie Pasqua Masbach, an amazing um, midwife. Yeah. And I had Lonnie Morris. Yeah. My, delivered my, my, my last, my fourth. My third was an interesting story. I think you might remember that I was trying to go to the childbirth center in Englewood where Lonnie, which was Lonnie's childbirth center. And uh, we did not make it. He was born within... 20 minutes of me getting out of bed. Yeah, like the bottom of your steps or something. Didn't make it out the front door. <laughs> in the fall, set, his head still in the membranes. And, you know, I had to push him out. And his father caught him and, you know, kind of peeled the membranes off and rattled them <laughs> over and give it to me. And I kind of rubbed his back and went from blue to pink. And then I just laid down on the floor and began breastfeeding. <laughs> Whew. so it that was intense. it happened so fast you didn't have time to think you just acted instinctively yeah you know, so it's something that every woman has in them and you kind of like respond if the situation demands that you kind of jump into action yeah you don't have a choice you have to just do it you know so so talking about acting instinctively this is um what we'll, we'll kind of jump ahead to to breastfeeding um which this is breastfeeding month and one of the reasons why I wanted you to, to share um, your story this month. And I, I, I think everyone assumes that there's like this instinct, we're gonna know exactly what to do. It's gonna be perfect and happy and blissful. And, um, but you also shared that you had sisters to help you. And um, what I learned that it wasn't exactly smooth sailing and easy. Um, but I, I brought women into my life, um, that helped me figure things out. So if it's not smooth sailing, if it's not perfectly instinctual, gather a team right early on. Definitely. I mean, with my first baby, I had the classics, you know, painful nipples, uh, uh, a rough third or fourth night in my house, trying to get him to latch and he's screaming and not latching. Uh, finally, my mother was on the other side of the door with a bottle of formula ready to feed oh. the baby. <laughs> and I was stressing out over the pressure of, you know, trying to get, but I just kind of muscled through it. Finally, he latched on, it settled down. You know, the painful engorgement, the cracked bleeding nipples, a fussy colicky baby. I experienced all of it with my first one, but I, I would call in tears um first my sisters-in-law who are the ones who I knew were breastfeeding and friends of mine who I knew were breastfeeding for help and then finally somebody I remember that my childbirth educator was had mentioned La Leche League so I finally called La Leche League and that was the one person who kind of talked me off the ledge and guided me and made me feel better made me feel like I was experiencing something normal that a lot of people experience and that guide some guidance and just just being heard just being listened to just brought a sense of relief and hope and determination that I could keep doing this and succeed and by the time he was six weeks old exactly like that one lovely chili leader I'll never forget her name Pat DeLuca told me <laughs> um it's going to get better by around six weeks and at that time it just sort of magically I was able to The soreness had dissipated, my nipples had healed, he was breastfeeding, he was gaining weight. And I was like feeling so much better about everything and not even worrying about things anymore. Right, right. And I'm sure that time frame, that six week time frame, is maybe when a lot of people feel like, ugh, I give up. This is this is too much. They don't have someone supportive to talk to. Yeah. And that's one of the problems that I find today, even all these years later, almost 30 years later, some of the challenges that we had, 
we didn't even have an internet back then. <laughs> now you have people who know too much of the wrong stuff and not enough of the right stuff. This almost compounding the problems that we had before making them worse now because now women have to weed through all the clouded, iffy, not right for you information. Right. They're always focusing on, I need to know this, 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 and this, and that, instead of tuning into your own instincts. Going back to that idea of like, you know, does this feel right to me? Does it feel right to my baby? You know, I always, I, my favorite phrase to tell people is, if you were the first woman on earth, what would you do? You know, you, there's no one to ask any questions of. You would have to like really resort to that guttural instinct of survival of yourself and survival of your baby. And when in doubt, you would just put the baby to the press whenever. In fact, if the baby cried too much, you would be like sounding the alarm for the predator or for the enemy. You, you would be prey in no time. So you always fed the baby on the man. It didn't matter that it was every 10 minutes or every hour, you just fed your baby. Then your milk came in bountifully, and then you finally had a baby that was satisfied. And you learned about raising a baby just by watching and following your gut. Nowadays, we want the experts. We want everybody to tell us exactly what to do, which can sometimes cloud what is the right thing for each individual mother, baby pair, and family. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly said. I love that. Love that. You. You, you gave me great advice that I, I wanna share. Um, in 21 years ago. And I think I called you with a terrible sinus infection mm. and I, my face hurt and I wanted to take some Sudafed and you were trying to gently tell me that that's probably not a great idea um, that will impact you in a not so fantastic way, but it'll also go through the breast milk to the baby and, um, well, more than getting to the baby, Sudafed is known to reduce milk supply. Mm. So it was going to dry you up if you took it for any length of time. Yeah. And so you cued me in for the first time ever that there might be other things that are causing my sinus infection. Maybe not just a germ that got into my nose, but something that's impacting my immunity, my ability to fight off this germ. So you were the very first person to kind of get to the root cause to say, well, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it has something to do with the foods you're eating, or I had never heard that before. You were the first of many, um, multiple people after that said, told me, well, maybe gluten and dairy are impacting your sinus infections, your, your eczema, your stomach aches. And, um, eventually I, got an MS diagnosis and went to a functional nutritionist and went off of gluten and dairy. And I've never had a sinus infection again. <laughs> well, similarly to you, I kind of, in my own roundabout way, um, found out that if I, because my son was sensitive to dairy, I took it out of my diet. And all of a sudden I had a propensity also for sinus infections and mm. all of a sudden, I wasn't getting sick as much as I was before. So for me, dairy was also a trigger. It's something that I don't do, you know, as much anymore. I didn't do it at all for 14 years while I was breastfeeding my kids because I did not want to go through what I went through with my first one. Wow. And his colic and his projectile vomiting, mm. and all was really in his ear infections, all because I had had too much dairy. He was very sensitive to it. Wow. Yeah. But I love your, your advice, just to kind of look at the root cause, listen to your instinct that everybody might need a little bit, something different. We're all different. Each mother baby pair is different. Um, I just love the whole, the whole idea. It is kind of critical to pay, pay attention to one's own body and listen to your own body. Yeah. Always. Yeah. I wonder if, if you had like an internal sense of that with, from your dance background, just absolutely. listening to your body. Yeah, absolutely. You knew when something didn't feel right. And even at the, the, the smallest little thing. Yeah. Um, I think it was really when I started working 
uh, with a lay midwife who was also an herbalist. And she guided me through a lot of these things I was already discovering instinctively. Um, you know, the idea of taking probiotics with regularity to help my immune system, to, to help my digestion, to clear my digestive system so that the good quality foods I was eating would be properly absorbed and help nourish me and keep me, you know. And also I did um, some concoctions called infusions, which I was actually brewing uh, a nice clump of uh, all these herbs, like everybody takes his mother's milk tea and they're doing lactation cookies and all this stuff nowadays. And there's really no therapeutic value to any of that stuff. But the stuff that I was brewing, which was like a portion of dried nettle herb or red clover or red raspberry leaf tea or oat straw, and then infusing them with boiled hot water for four hours and then straining and drinking that as an infusion was actually extremely nourishing. You were leaching all the vitamins and minerals out of these very powerful herbs into water and then drinking it and just getting like a big boost of very highly absorbable vitamins and minerals. Right. Uh, so I learned that nutrition, specialized nutrition and specialized care for women while you know, pregnant and breastfeeding, which is something that I also did is I was breastfeeding my first child while I was pregnant with my second child. And then I went on to tandem nurse, which means nursing a toddler, my first child and a new baby. And then I did that again with, when the third one was born, I was definitely nursing the second one and sometimes the first <laughs> as well as the baby. You know? Yeah. I think the only time I did in tandem nurse was when the fourth one was born. There was a right. big year gap and third one had no interest so it was fine right such good memories of motherhood and breastfeeding like there's kind of if I went to like my happy place it might be like sitting in a chair listening to some music and looking down at the baby breastfeed and then the, and then they look up at you and smile or they still have the nipple in their mouth it's like like it warms your heart like nothing else it was it was their their eyes of gratitude mm, being, yes. of being in that safe place comforted loved nourished yeah you know, that's a unique feeling it's, yeah it's a very unique feeling yeah um and yes i would agree that that is also my happy <laughs> that was a very big <laughs> happy place for me to just yeah. nursing, sitting on the couch and nursing <coughs> excuse me <coughs> Let me have a sip. Yeah. Originally, I did have a little spritzer. <laughs> Good. Handy. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, um, what does a day look like for you now that you are? Um, tell us the letters after your name and what they stand for and what you do. So I uh, got, I, once I became an electric leader, I prepared to um, become a board certified lactation consultant, which is what IBCLC stands for, International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. And that is, sorry. <coughs> No problem, take your time. <clears throat> that is the highest level of certification in lactation. Um, there are other levels of certification like certified lactation counselors, lactation educators, lactation counselors, breastfeeding counselors, BC, whatever. But for this one, I had to really prepare. I needed uh, 2,500 at that time, 2,500 clinical hours of practice helping women breastfeed I needed to take uh, six additional courses, anatomy and physiology, child development, child psychology, medical terminology, statistics, and, um, and then study from a couple of pretty big textbooks and then apply to take an exam with recommendations and uh, then um, take the exam. So I was board certified in 2005. 
And then I did other things. I worked at, I worked at a research study at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx involved um, a randomized controlled trial of 900 women that were divided into four groups. One group had no intervention. One group had the intervention of just the lactation consultant, another one just the doctor, and another one had the intervention of both lactation consultant and, a phys and her OBGYN. And uh, of course, the study showed that the women who initiated lasted longer and exclusively breastfed did get to see both the lactation consultant and the doctor. So you do need the time and detailed information and compassion and empathy and support and, and education of skills that a, can, a lactation can provide. But it's also really great when a physician endorses it and asks about breastfeeding, mm -hmm. even if it's a short question. And the study showed that that was the highest, uh, the best outcomes were when you have those two people. So that was my first job. Mm -hmm. Then I worked for WIC, which stands for Women and Infant and Children uh, in Union City, Hudson County here in New Jersey. And I loved working in that community because I was, a, um, I would say 85 to 90% of the community was Hispanic. And I was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. So I was utilizing Spanish every day. Nothing like establishing empathy with another human than speaking in their own language. So that was a huge advantage. And there's a famous saying by Theodore Roosevelt that says, no one cares how much you know until they know or feel how much you care. And so I always, I am grateful for my La Leche League training because they really uh, talked a lot about, uh, trained us in communication skills. Yeah. how to listen empathetically, how to reflect back but what a woman says to you makes her feel that she has been heard. So then you can start at the point of her concerns, educating her about, you know, whether all, everybody in my family had low milk production, or um, I'm afraid that I might not make enough milk, or, you know, I've heard that it hurts when I feed a baby. So these are the kind of questions that I would really get when I was working with them. But while I was working there, I got my dream job, <laughs> which was to work in a hospital. Because I was already practicing as a board certified lactation consultant. And what I was seeing was like, oh, wow. If this mom had been told X, Y, or C in the hospital, her situation could have been prevented. So I said, well, if I want to make the most difference, I want to work at the source of the place where I can make the most impact right at the beginning, right? Um, so I was, because I was also very skilled at leading support groups, which I did with La Leche League, thanks to La Leche League again, I was trained in um, leading groups and Hoboken University Medical Center in Hoboken had a really popular support group. And the lactation consultant that was working there was leaving and they were looking for someone to replace her. So they brought me in, they interviewed me, they offered me the position, and I started working there uh, in a hospital setting as a board, international board certified lactation consultant. Now I'm not a nurse, I'm just a uh, well-educated you know, uh, person, but um, it's very rare for an IBCLC that does not have an RN to be able to get into the hospital setting and work. Mm -hmm as a lactation consultant. Hmm. So I felt like that was a huge stroke of luck, um, but it was because of my communication skills and leading the support group, which was a very popular support group right. for the hospital. Good uh, community um, support, good community offering um, on behalf of the hospital to the community. Um, the group was really well attended. We would have someone, sometimes 35 moms to 50 moms to show up. It was like La Leche League on steroids, <laughs> you can imagine. And it was a little bit overwhelming to be able to meet the needs of so many people all yeah. at the same time. So it was, I was out of my comfort zone somewhat. But I also loved being able to meet the parents in the hospital immediately after the birth of their babies. and and just get them started with breastfeeding, show them correct positioning, talk to them about the importance of frequent feeding, of 
um, the importance of colostrum and how do you trigger and set yourself up with a good milk supply if you feed frequently. Um, telling them to avoid formula, unless it was medically indicated, you know. Um, there was a lot of parents who were very, hot. you know, working in the hospital setting is completely different than you could ever imagine. You, you see every range of challenge, you know, and you learn a lot about conditions that, you know, you didn't know existed. So you're learning how to help different people from all walks of life, yeah. breastfeed, or at least achieve their feeding goals for their infant. Whether it was exclusive breastfeeding, which it was combination feeding, which it was, I'm only gonna pump and breastfeed, or I'm mostly gonna do formula. And then you just have to educate them where they're at. You just meet people where they're at. If a mom said, I don't wanna breastfeed, then I would have to tell her, well, this is what's gonna to happen to your body. You're going to make milk. And this is the best way for you to safely allow your body to uh, involute or for the milk to go away. Right. So. Think of how many people you've helped, Carmen. You started oh. helping people, you know, you helped me and there are people you were helping before me and there's hundreds of people that you're helping every, every year. Yeah. Yeah. We're grateful for you. I don't even keep track. I wish, but I didn't have the foresight that, I, that yeah. this would happen. You just in the moment so much all the time. And now I think, you know, if I... If I see 1,200 families at the hospital, plus the ones, because I also do have a private practice, plus the ones that I see from the private practice, maybe that's like, you know, 200 to 500 a year. Right. So that's, and then I've been board certified for 16 years. So do the math. Thousands, thousands of babies you have helped to be healthier, moms that you've yeah. helped to be healthier. And there's the, the, pay it forward effect. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of moms who are now board certified lactation consultants who I'm, whom I helped, who are thriving and paying it forward to other moms, many, many other moms. Yeah. Uh, I have moms who maybe didn't go as far as that, but encouraged their sister or their friends, supported other people. Right. And your, your pay it forward goes in so many different directions because I mean, I breastfed my kids because my mom breastfed me. It was like what I was, I, it was just an expectation. It was an, it was normal. Um, and so you're going to let that pay forward, pay forward, pay forward. Um, if we can like look at some of the, the history of, of breastfeeding kind of in, in the United States. Um, I mean, August is National Breastfeeding Month. Um, August 25th to the 31st is Black Breastfeeding Week. World Breastfeeding Week was the first week in August with the theme of protect breastfeeding, a shared responsibility. So there's obviously a need to continue, continually educate and promote breastfeeding. Um, why do you think breastfeeding is threatened and we need these organizations to, um, to promote breastfeeding when it was how we survived as a race, as a culture, as, a, as humans? Why do we still well, why do we have to protect breastfeeding? Well, let's just talk, was, you mentioned educate. We'll start with that. Okay. Um, it's education is where it's at not just education of parents. I'm not talking about taking a prenatal breastfeeding class. I'm talking about education of staff, staff in the hospital. Let's start with the people who first lay hands on a mother and a baby, DOB, the pediatrician, the labor and delivery nurses, the postpartum nurses. When I do my private practice, I often ask, where did you give birth and what did you get seen by a lactation consultant or did the nurses help you with breastfeeding? You wouldn't believe the amount of misinformation being given to them by staff, including many times lactation consultants. Okay. Um, and it requires very sensitive training and consistent education, not just a one-time, two-hour class, but at the very least, yearly 
reviews of what is important, what is skin to skin, what is colostrum, how do you position a baby? Um, how do you solve challenges? When do you get the lactation consultant? You know, just things like that. What, I, I, what language do you use to communicate? Empathy is sh very short-handed. Just asking someone how they are. How are you feeling today? You know, and letting them tell you about how they're feeling and then taking that information and then introducing yourself. I'm here to help you with breastfeeding. What are your concerns? What questions do you have? And then you take it from there. But people walk, I've heard of lactation consultants walking into a room and shoving a baby to the breast. There's no, hi, how are you? Um, can I help you with latching? Um, baby is pushed in very often the head is pushed in stuff like that I hear that and I'm very very surprised that that is still happening so then you have the pediatricians you know if there's any type of delay any slight medical issue the go-to to fix everything is let's get formula they don't even ask does the mother have milk can we just pump and give her some, or can she hand express and give some of the colostrum? Let's just go to formula. It's usually what happens most of the time. There's a lot of baby who have feeding difficulties for various issues and um, they just assume it's always a mother's fault and they don't even look at the baby having a poor latch or difficulty creating vacuum or sustaining the latch, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So they always assume as a mother and then we give formula because the mother doesn't have milk and that's why the baby's becoming jaundice or not, main, not maintaining their blood sugar levels. So, so I am having a little bit of a part in doing some staff education um, well before the pandemic and uh, up until March 17 of 2020, I was doing staff education, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of hours and almost all, I got almost all through all the nurses and a couple of the neonatologists attendant and a couple of residents attended. And this year I was asked by the family medicine residency program at the hospital to do the breastfeeding review. But I only get to do two hours and cover a ton of information in two hours is practically impossible. So I did the one hour first initial class and I'm supposed to do the second one in September. Um, but then why is this so important? Because you ask a pediatrician or an OBGYN, how many hours of breastfeeding education did you get throughout your medical school career? And you will most likely hear zero. Maybe one hour, maybe two hours. Uh, my prenatal breastfeeding class to parents is a three hour class. They learn more about breastfeeding than the doctors actually know or were prepared with. So that's why I'm so adamant of education. And so they don't really value, they don't really understand how important breastfeeding is for the maternal, the benefits for the mother, the benefits for the infant. They kind of hear it and they can repeat it by rote, but they don't live it. So it's really hard to um, be supportive if you don't understand the nuances of lactation. Yeah. Um, and then, so who fills in the blank? The formula companies. Unless you're a baby-friendly hospital, your hospital, wherever and a mom gives birth, gets formula for free. The formula ribs come into the hospital, bring bucket loads of formula. They actually make hospitals sign a contract that this is the only formula that they will hand out and that they will they commit to handing out X amount of formula per year. Yep. Even though my daughter was born at home, Similac delivered. You at your house? At my house, to my doorstep. So they must have found the birth certificate okay. records and my address and delivered formula to my doorstep. So the reason why <laughs> finally answered the main question mm -hmm. is that there's a big financial interest from the formula companies. A hospital handing out brand X or Z is a direct endorsement. If the hospital is giving it out, it must be a good thing for my baby. 
Right. It's just an immediate message that even people giving it out don't really realize that that's what's happening, that it is comparable or the same as breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Even in this day and age, that still sometimes is the understanding by many people. Okay. Right. Um, so there's a big financial part, corporate interest. A lot of people make a lot of money by giving out free formula in the hospitals and the, then the families that that sort of sabotages breastfeeding a bit. It's really hard to get restore lactation once you have been giving a lot of formulas, unless thank goodness that today we have these heavy duty pumps available for parents to do a lot of pumping to get the milk back. But, um, you know, you can only do this so, go so far with that. And then you have babies who have difficulty latching and sustaining the latch and learning how to latch because yeah. they've been heavily supplemented with the wrong kind of bottle. So, right. So yes, financial, right. Money, 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 money. Yeah. Corporate America. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the truth. We had to get there. Um, so if we can get to the, the title of the, of the talk is short and long-term benefits for mom and baby. So I'm sure you have your, um, your, well, your short list and your long list. The thing about it is that short term are only if you only breastfeed for a short while. And even if you work were to breastfeed for a short, short while, there are long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. Even if you only breastfeed a little bit, let's say you only breastfeed for five days and you really breastfeed, your baby gets colostrum. The colostrum coats the intestinal tract. It provides the first inoculation of the microbiome. Okay, the baby gets microbiome in colostrum. It populates the digestive tract, which prepares the baby to digest milk. It helps the baby ex expel meconium and the baby receives immunities that the mother has. So whatever the mother has been exposed to in terms of diseases, including topic of the pandemic, COVID-19, if the mother had COVID-19 or got the immunization, she's gonna pass the antibodies that she created in response. So even if the baby, you know, doesn't breastfeed for a long time, but just for a short while, it's going to re receive some pretty big benefits to just a few days of breastfeeding. Um, also, when you immediately after birth, when you place a baby in skin to skin contact, that helps stabilize the baby. You know, they will, it regulates, helps regulate the baby's body temperature, the respiratory rate, because it feels not stressed. There's not as many stress hormone. The baby won't burn as many calories, so its blood sugar will be more stable. And the baby releases oxytocin when it's in skin's contact with the mother, so that helps the baby be more calm. Um, and being in skin-to-skin -skin contact on the mother triggers a response from the baby to initiate a series of stages that culminate in searching and finding the breast and latching on for the first time. You know, so your baby is neurologically being stimulated to do certain things, to initiate certain movements that will lead to latching. Um, also, the baby gets to make eye contact for the first time with the parent. It's a beautiful moment when the baby is finally trying to bob his head around and lifts it up because it hears the mother's voice and makes eye contact with the mom. Or the same if daddy comes over and welcomes his new baby, baby might actually turn the head and make eye contact, you know? So like just by the idea of placing a baby in skin to skin with the intent of breastfeeding, just having that moment itself is extremely valuable. Right. So short-term, but with long-term Im impact, okay? For the mother, the same thing, having the baby on top of her, even if she's uncomfortable, 
Maybe she's in pain from having pushed the baby out. Maybe she had a tear or an episiotomy. Maybe she's not feeling great. If you put that baby on top of her, and it also triggers instincts in the mother, her oxytocin continues to release just from feeling the baby, which helps contract the uterus and reduce the risk of hemorrhage. You know, she's con she begins to connect with the baby and without anybody telling her, she begins to stroke the baby and bond with the baby. And just that initial connection is also very important, very powerful for mom and baby, because then she will be more sensitive and respond more readily to her baby's cues, whether they're feeding cues, whether they're discomfort cues, whether it's I miss you cues. That initial moment, again, will have her be more responsive, more readily responsive, because that's what feels right to her. She's connected with this baby. She's really protecting and taking care of this baby while holding this baby and skin to skin with the intent of eventually having the baby latch on and breastfeed. Um, yeah. But I mean, further than that, you know, you know, when you think about, so if you're giving baby immune factors or if your baby, let's say your baby's breastfeeding, you're at the three month mark, somebody comes over that has a cold and baby is exposed to this virus, the baby begins fighting it by wanting to feed more frequently. So it's receiving, it's sending a signal through the saliva of the baby to the mother's nipple, to the breast. So, hey, I'm fighting this virus. So then mother's body begins to make antibodies to fight this virus. So the baby gets fed in the breast milk these antibodies. When I first learned that, I thought that's, that's like magic. That's amazing <laughs> that the baby's saliva can tell the mom this is what I need more of. Oh, let me, let me do a little code and I'll send some an <laughs> antibodies your way. And there you go. And how the, the breast milk changes based on um, if it's a hot well, day or a cold baby. day or right. yeah. It's gonna or be based on the age of the baby, like you be, breast milk is made. The, bre the breast milk that a mother makes for her five day old is different than the one she makes for her three week old and six week old and three month old and six month old and one year old and two year old, yeah. you know, it's completely different based on the growing needs of the baby, a baby zero to three months, a baby's growing a big brain very quickly. You know? yes. So, and the composition of breast milk is something to marvel at, you know, talk about the biochemistry of breast milk and all the different components that some of them, we don't even know what they are, why they're there and why they're there. So it's very unique. So not only does the milk change as the baby gets older, but it changes throughout the feeding, you know, ending with the fatty milk towards the end of that feeding, which is higher in some magical hormones that make the baby digest his food better and get sleepy. I hear something that is really disturbing these days, that parents shouldn't let their babies fall asleep at breast. Mm. This is something that goes completely against mother nature. And you're missing out on that wonderful experience of watch your baby enter what I call la la land. Those final moments when they're falling and they're drifting off, their mm -hmm. eyes are rolling, they're drinking the last few drops of that milk with this magical um, hormone that makes them sleepy and feel content and full and satisfied. You know, are you going to do pop the kid off and then put them down while drowsy and then let them fall asleep on their own? There's something completely against. Mother, first woman on earth would not have done that. Right, right. <laughs> But so, and then it actually changes in composition from the day, the beginning of the day, early part of the day, the milk is a certain composition and it changes as the day progresses. It actually increases in fat. So. Amazing. Yeah. I was reading um, an article by Darcia Narvaez from Psychology Today. It was called Breastfeeding in the USA, a little history. And she was uh -huh. writing that more and more studies show the nearly magical qualities of breast milk. Um, 
she, let me pull up a quote from that article. Um, so she was saying, the other day I overheard a graduate student in developmental psychology say she thought that infant formula food stuff is as good for babies as breast milk. I'm afraid that most Americans have the same mistaken attitude and are equally uneducated about breast milk's importance. It pays to know a little history about how this attitude came about, especially as more and more studies show the nearly magical qualities of breast milk. And she goes on to talk about the, the history of how breastfeeding kind of changed in the United States. It started with immigration and women having to work in factories. And um, when World War II was also hugely impactful. Yeah, because the men were gone at war. The women had to take the jobs of the men. The grandmothers had to feed babies left at home. Mm -hmm. And that's really when formula became an industry. Right. Right. You know, regretfully, I mean, we, we've, we've gone through so many uh, social, like social traumas, like a war like that. And we're still yeah. ongoing many social traumas. So, so how can, yeah. how can we support as a shared responsibility breastfeeding today because you know most people don't have the luxury of staying at home with their with their babies for extended periods i mean especially in the united states we don't get if you stay at home well unless it's pandemic and you can work <laughs> from a zoom call typically you don't get paid to work from home um how how do we support a, a breastfeeding woman as a culture as an individual what are your recommendations well, i mean the Surgeon General of the United States of America actually has a blueprint. Mm. And it's not old, but it's been around for at least 15 years. And it is specifically directs all the members of society, starting with the inner circle, you know, the partner of the breastfeeding person, then the close family, then the medical health professional surrounding, then the members of her immediate community, then the, her society and culture at large, and then government and what each of their roles should be. Uh, and you're basically going right back down to educating everybody and then to providing the support necessary. And there's so many ways out. I mean, women need, like the first thing, longer leaves. They need to be able to stay home longer to take care of their babies if they really want women to. I mean, I think it's 13 billion that would save yearly in healthcare cost if 90% of women breastfeed. Reduced risk of diabetes, reduced risk of obesity. What is keep help me out? What uh, else? Um uh, metabolic syndromes, you know, uh, gestational diabetes, well, regular type, type two and type one, um, for the, for the mother as well, osteoporosis, reduced right. risk of breast cancer, premenopausal breast cancer, reduced risk of ovarian cancer, uh, re reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, for a woman and for for an infant is, of course, a reduced risk of upper respiratory infection, lower respiratory infection, um, digestive system, you know, like stomach viruses, right. asthma, diarrhea, allergies. asthma, allergies. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's a big so, list. And there's, there's, there's so many more, you know, but it's not yeah. even... It's like psychological impact is emotional impact. And just women are not getting, they're not getting sufficiently supported. It's, and be, but that's because people are not trained or equipped to provide the support. Right. I'll never forget the one, there was an incident once that I witnessed and I reported and because it was com complete utter lack of empathy and proper language and communication skills on this person's part. And um, that triggered a whole, everybody must get trained <laughs> situation. Okay, good. So, but, you know, a lot of people look the other way, don't say anything, take it, 
oh, it's just what it, it is, what it is, you know, but it, it boils down to educating everybody. Yeah. Really boils down to bringing everybody on board and having a really deep understanding of what it takes to support women in our society. Yeah. I think it's happening. Um, there is a lot more support in many ways, but like I said before, there's a lot of confusing information out in the web. There's a lot of blogs, a lot of opinions um, without really, and they should really utilize the services of lactation consultants. Lactation consultants should just be like, you go to the pediatrician at day five, you go to the, you go to the lactation consultant at day, as soon as you need it, which could be anywhere between day three and day seven. Yeah. yeah but they should be, should be like, um, should be regular, care everyone should, should go to a lactation consultant are there enough around the i don't know <laughs> we yeah. need more Good question. Yeah. there's we need more and they need lots of training you know right. we need more programs that specialize in mentoring lactation consultants and especially of women of color yeah. okay that is where we have our big deserts especially in the state of New Jersey, and I'm sure many other places too. Yeah. There are enough, there are not enough women of color as lactation consultants taking care of women of color because we, we, you know, they will, they need the support in all socioeconomic levels too. You, you need every, any people that can afford a lactation consultant. There's people who cannot afford them either. So, um, right. That's why part of me loved working with WIC so much because I really felt I was helping the underserved. Right. And that's what it is. I don't bump into women breastfeeding very often. Like, I can't remember okay. the last time. It was maybe at a La Leche League meeting, and you don't see it out and about. Um, it's, I think it's hidden. Um, in my second childbirth class when I was pregnant with my daughter, my second pregnancy, there was a woman from Jamaica who was training to be a doula and she was sitting in on the class and um, she was real quiet at one time. And um, Susan, who was teaching it, asked, you know, what are you, what are you thinking? And she said, I just have to say, <laughs> um, like you all have to go to classes to learn how to like have a baby and oh, here comes, here comes a visitor how to, how to have a baby and how to breastfeed. She's like, this is like normal in my culture. Like I've watched people get born. I've watched people die. I grew up with this as part of the culture, but it's like natural things <laughs> are very isolated to different places in, in our culture now, you know, you're born in a hospital, you die in a hospital, you breastfeed in private. Um, you know, I like like the breastfeeding sit-ins where people are just in the middle of the street. We're breastfeeding. It's normal. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> wish, um, yeah, yeah, I wish there was more of that. And I wish, but you know, you also have, it's hard because unless a person is comfortable doing that, you know, and part of it is that because of the culture and the society that we live in, yeah. they're, they don't they're, they don't feel comfortable. I think all of us, I mean, felt uncomfortable <laughs> initially, right? I remember the first time, you know, I went to the mall with my mom and dad and my firstborn, and I brought a bottle of expressed milk, and I said to my mom, you know, it's maybe you can warm it up a little bit. So she walks over to one of the, at the food court, one of the stands and asks the guy behind the counter to warm it up. And he just sticks it in the microwave and it explodes. <gasps> so I lose that milk, which I was <sighs> like, my baby. <laughs> so my mother returns and reports the, what happened? And then, well, like I have a hungry baby. So I had no choice, but you know, unzip and put my son to the breast right there in the food court in front of my dad, who I believe I lost away. 
because it was just not something you saw anybody else doing. But I had to feed my kid, so I did it. And it felt like the right thing to do anyway. I just didn't feel quite comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we've been talking for a long time. I don't want to keep you all night, but I want to transition. So, I mean, I'm such a, an advocate of breastfeeding um, for, for so many reasons, for mom, for baby, for the emotional connection and bonding for the short and long-term health benefits for baby and mom. Um, professionally, I'm now working on the other end of the spectrum for, for aging and dementia prevention and early intervention. And um, one of the things that we're learning that's really key in keeping the brain healthy, you mentioned earlier is metabolic health. Um, yes. So insulin sensitivity. Um, My next biggest passion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we both lost our, our moms to Alzheimer's and dementia. And I am sorry for your loss and I understand it. Likewise. Um, is that part of your thinking um, or is it now? Well, I mean, I changed. I, 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 before I became a mother, I thought I was a pretty healthy eater. When I became a mother and I saw, I look, I revisited my diet and I realized I'm really not a very healthy eater. I eat a lot of the same thing over again. There's not a whole lot of variety. And again, from my literally one of the tenets is eat food as close to their natural state as possible in the greatest variety possible. Okay. So, and if I go back, if you choose, so if you start looking at food that way, Close to natural natural state, that means, well, not processed food, packaged in a box. It has 10, or sorry, 25 different ingredients yeah. some that you can't pronounce. So that's not, there's nothing natural about that. So that you go to the store, you immediately like, okay, well, I'm not buying any of this. You end up buying more, more fruits, more vegetables, you know, protein, you know, healthy stuff that comes from trees. <laughs> and not in plants and not so much uh, things that are manufactured in a factory. Right. So also we eat a lot of highly processed greens in typical American diet and we eat huge portions. You know, we're like eating a huge amounts of food all the time. You know, it's like we would probably be fine with half of what we normally put in our mouth. So then in, when I learned about my mother's illness, I mean, we began to think about, is this, could this be help nutritionally? And through another friend of mine, I came across Dr. Mary Newport, who is a neonatologist coincidentally, who worked um, in her work knew that MCT or medium chain triglycerides um, were being added to babies, to baby formulas who these babies were being premature babies. Okay. And MCT, medium chain tri triglycerides, are also made in the milk. Right? Yeah. The only other place there, you can find it. But sometimes these babies are being supplemented. So right. they had to put it into formulas so that they right. babies would grow and they would have enough energy. Anyway, so, and then she also happened, her husband, happened to have early onset Alzheimer's. And she was trying to get him into all these drug trials to see if he could slow it down because he was losing it very quickly. He was, both, I think, our mothers were in this slow, gradual, you know, um, development of Alzheimer's. <laughs> but, uh, that's the young, the baby, that's the 20 year old. Baby. <laughs> no longer a baby. Hi. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah, he's a puppy. He's only eight months old and only <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I learned about the ketogenic diet through her. Yeah. Because she put her husband, she started giving him a whole lot of coconut oil and she reversed her husband's Alzheimer's yeah. quite a bit. You know, by yep. changing his diet 
and primarily giving him foods that would make him uh, use ketones as his main source of energy or right. fats. So burning fat was his way of sustaining his metabolic metabolism that provide better function for his brain. Right. So I began to eat a ketogenic diet. Yes. At that time, that was 2015. Right. In addition yep. to doing some other things that helped me stay in ketosis, you know. Right. And, and the, immediate, the main thing that I noticed immediately was increased focus, increased attention, increased comprehension, thinking at deeper levels, mm -hmm. um, you know, just going beyond the surface in general. And just as, you know, like that afternoon slump that you get after you have your lunch, you're like, okay, no, I need an app. That wasn't happening anymore. Huh. Um, better sleep, deeper sleep, vivid dreams. So better brain function. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yep. I and, you know, I think people don't realize. And then so we have these the current diet where like our body is completely operating on the glucose metabolism, taxing our pancreas, becoming, you know, insulin resistant. You know, it's just sort of not the right road to be on. And that's why I can tell you on an observational level that the rate of obesity and in maternal morbidities, pregnant women, I mean, it's like if you have 10 in labor, five have GDM. Just it's 18 you know, diabetes. What is that? Yeah. I mean, that pandemic probably has not helped, but I'm just telling you what I'm observing. Right. Increasing, increasing, continuing to increase rates of metabolic syndrome because their diets are really, really, really high. Not just a little bit, but really high in carbohydrates. Yeah. So I teach the Bredesen protocol, Dr. Dale Bredesen and his Bredesen 7. Number one thing on the list is to incur for brain health to prevent um, Alzheimer's and, or to reverse for an early, from an early intervention um, perspective is to do what he calls the keto flex 12, three. So it is low levels of ketosis, just like you said, to have the body use, utilize ketones for the brain. It's much more efficient for the brain to use ketones and glucose. We want to maintain metabolic flexibility so that we can use glucose or ketones both. Um, but then the 12, three stands for go 12 hours without eating. So an intermittent fast and three stands for don't eat three hours before bed. And if you have an APOE four gene, which increases risk of, of Alzheimer's that you should extend that fast, um, 14 to 16 hours. So the gene, it's an APOE4. So um, you can do a, a genetic test to see if you have that. With that gene, you also have an increased risk of, of being gluten um, sensitive, gluten intolerant, um, increased risk for um, in, in increased intestinal permeability. Um, you mentioned earlier breastfeeding yeah. and the gut microbiome and how you can get inoculated from a vaginal birth coming through the birth canal. We didn't mention already, but even if there's a C-section, you can still rub the, the fluids on the baby to get inoculated, but then the colostrum that you said, so beneficial for the gut, that's going to help you when you're 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, because your gut was inoculated and um, way back. So yeah. It's a lot. And it's just like, again, it boils down to education, but we are fighting the constant bombardment of um, advertising of products that are not good for our health, but we have associated that we need them and then they're comfort. They provide comfort. So it's difficult to make these switches and transitions. I am actually constant as part of lactation and people are asking me, you know, what to eat, what not to eat mm -hmm. during breastfeeding, mm -hmm. I give him my rundown, you know, of, of like increase your healthy fats, cut your carbs in half and double your vegetables. And that just, it's a simple thing to think 
about and just raises awareness. But also, I think a lot of people don't realize that carbs are not just, you know, the potato, the rice, the pasta, the bread. <laughs> they don't realize that there's a lot of carb carbs and sugar and and um, I mean, meant to say and um, juices and very very high glycemic fruits. Right. Um, so they and also. And so many other things, like a lot of packaged goods, like they'll think they're eating a healthy bar, like a kind bar. And it's like, oh my God, it has more sugar and more carbs than a Snickers bar. Yeah. So, and then you're not really <laughs> eating something healthy. <laughs> there's, there's so much, there's so much to learn. Um, you're doing an amazing part at getting people on the right track at the very beginning of life. Um, so we could probably talk forever, but I, I've kept you long enough and I want to thank you tremendously for sharing your time, your knowledge. Um, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, um, how can they do that if they happen to live in your area? And if they're not in New Jersey and they need a lactation consultant, how do they find one? Well, I mean, first, in order to get, in the best way to get in touch with me, I do have a minimal website. It's called breastfeedingmama, M-O-M-M-A.com. So breastfeedingmama.com. I also have an Instagram page, which I'm working a little bit more on developing. It's Carmen Baker, I-V-C-L-C. So simple, my first name, last name, and my initials for my certification. And I put up a lot of information and people can contact me that way as well. You can just send me a DM through the air. Um, what else? And then- and so Do you do that, virtual consults for breast? I do everything. I've done everything. Yeah. Okay. I do, I'm, I'm mostly doing home visits. Right. You no, know, I, I wear my N95, I, I follow my COVID protocol. I ask a lot of questions of the parents before I come to the home to be sure. I mean, you'd be surprised how many parents have already had COVID. Um, even during the pregnancy, some moms have had it. Have it. Uh, many are now vaccinated. Some are still not, you know, but that's why I always, you know, they're usually tested in the hospital. So I says, if I see them shortly after, uh, generally it's pretty safe. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a, a way to find a lactation consultant if they're not? In New Jersey, in New York. Well, in, in New Jersey, there is a way of finding them. It's zipmilk.org, Z-I-P-M-I-L-K.org. Uh, you type in your zip code and it's going to give you an hmm. idea, uh, you know, a listing of IBCLCs. Um, you can also go to uh, the IBLCE.org and go to their button that says find a lactation consultant. Okay. Uh, you can, I think you can also do it for ILCA, I-L-C-A, International Lactation Consultants Association, ILCA.org, and click on their Find a Lactation Consultant button. Okay. And Perfect. you'll be able to find someone. Um, you can also do the Google search. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, lactation find a lactation consultant, consultant. In your exactly. area, and yeah. it pops up. But always, you know, try to find people um that have some sort of references that have had some experience i would say to people ask well how many years have you been practicing uh, do you work with this particular situation do you have you ever worked with twins have you ever worked with low milk supply are you um do you know how to identify tongue ties um do you um work with oversupply, you know, different. Right. It's good to ask a question when interviewing a lactation consultant, especially if you have a, a set, a particular set of needs. And then I do virtuals, you yeah. know. I sometimes want to leap through the screen like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do help. I do find that it's really important to have the father present and two screens. I like the screen and I also like a movable screen, a phone. So that, that right. 
point so I can really observe the latch and go through the latch. And then I actually coach the dad in coaching the mom yeah. in, a, in a virtual lactation consultation. A lot of the times they just need a whole lot of education and reassurance. So there really isn't too much that's going on that needs to be solved, but just to be educated and answer mm-hmm. questions and do a lot of that. Yeah. So, but it's been great. Thank you. So good to connect with you. So good to talk about this. Yeah. For all of it. Thanks um, for doing your public service for the for the month. <laughs> my pleasure. Yeah. It's been fantastic to see you. Um, even it's though it's through a screen, it, I'll take it. It's yeah. It's, I'll take it. <laughs> We're in the area, we have yeah. got to get together and socially distance, perhaps. Yeah. So, Agreed. Okay. okay. Take care, Carmen. Thank you so much. You too, Laura. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye.